Let me say a couple of things before I get started here this morning. You can go ahead and find Ephesians chapter 1. I'm going to, I'm going to attempt to handle this and to say what I'm about to say over the next maybe 30 minutes or so. I'm going to try to make this quick because I'm hungry, y'all. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to... I didn't eat breakfast, so well. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to try and attempt to handle this with all humility. Okay, I want you to know a couple of things up front before I get into this. I'm in no way trying to point out any person. I'm not trying to criticize anyone, and I'm not talking about y'all. I'm talking about within Christianity, and I hope that you will not interpret what I am about to boldly say as arrogance, okay? So let's get that established first, because I'm fixing to do something that's out of the normal for me. Now, I'm going to bring this up, and you're probably going to, nah, I'm going to be really hungry now, <laughs> looking at these chocolate chip cookies. I know this may seem really strange and kind of irreverent, but and this is a really strange title for this message, but this is something that, well, here it goes. I'm going to talk to you about grace cookies. My, my kids saw me putting this together yesterday, and they said, we want some grace cookies. <laughs> and I said, no, no, you don't want any grace cookies here. And I'm also going to talk to you about holy milk, all right? I love cookies and milk, don't you, my Lord? But uh, nonetheless, please hear my heart in this uh, because I'm, I'm trying to raise awareness with something, okay? So I'm going to try to walk through this very delicately, and I don't want to present this in any way uh, that would be offensive to anyone, but at the same time, I have to speak what I see, and I also have to speak what I hear the Holy Spirit saying to me. So I want to look at Ephesians chapter 1. I believe I was in this verse, <coughs> excuse me, I was in this verse last week. Uh, I was in Ephesians quite a bit. Sometimes I get confused on what I've preached and what I've been studying, and I've been studying so much that it just, my mind just gets, so if I say that, y'all know what I'm talking about, then just nod your head and say, yeah, because it was, it was actually, I was studying it Thursday morning or something, okay, <laughs> all right, so, uh, so last week I was talking to you about inheritance and inheriting the promises, and I was in Ephesians 7, and I know we read this verse of scripture, so this is Ephesians 1 and 7, and Ephesians 1 and 7, very powerful verse of scripture, it says, in whom we have redemption, through his blood. Now, I had already preached to you earlier in the year about the blood of Jesus, the forgiveness of sin, according to the riches of his grace. Okay, so, and I had went on into talking about uh, how that we were inheritors uh, of the promises of God. And if you looked on down into verse 11, I believe that's one of the verses I came from. It said, in whom we have obtained an inheritance. So I'm going to try to start off real gingerly in this, okay? Most of the time, and I'm going to, I'm going to be talking to you about grace for just a few minutes, okay? <coughs> now, over the past several years, I've been trying to put some parameters and definition to the word grace. And when I went through Bible college, and I, I did not complete Bible college, I didn't sense that the Lord wanted me to complete it. He sent me home for nine years from there to pray, to get in my prayer closet and pray and study. But I've read pretty much every theology book uh, that I could get my hands on. You know, I've, I've read all about hermeneutics, hermeneutics homiletics, you know, apologetics. Uh, I've, I have, you can ask my wife, I have theology books that I, the cover is about worn out because I have read them so much. But most of the time, uh, what we find in the New Testament and what's common uh, is that the word grace is defined as unmerited favor. Now, I'm not trying to depart from that uh, definition, but I have 
been trying to, over the course of time, to expand this definition for us uh, so that we can grab hold of this in a, a greater encompassment of what this word is being communicated to us through the gospel. Before I go any further, let's pray, all right? Heavenly Father, I need your grace right now, and even more so, I need the utterance of the Holy Spirit. Lord, what you have laid into my heart today, God, I pray, Lord, that this will be presented in the spirit of wisdom, in the spirit of truth, in the spirit of love, and Lord, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that this won't just be spoken words, but God, I pray today, Lord, for an eye opening within my own heart, the hearts of everyone who hears the sound of my voice this morning, but God, more importantly, that they hear the sound of your voice. Lord, I pray that you will just bring forth the spirit of truth to us. For Lord, you said that we would know the truth and the truth would make us free. I thank you for the freedom and the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. I thank you for the liberty of the Holy Spirit in this place. You said that where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So I thank you for the liberty to be able to teach, the liberty to be able to learn, and the liberty to be able to receive from the Spirit of God. That's what I pray, Holy Spirit, is that this is your time, and these are your people, this is your church, and I pray, Father, that you will just instruct us and teach us in the way we should go. And I thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. So, going back here for just a second. Most commonly, you know, if, if you become a student of theology, I believe we should all be a student of theology. I've heard people say we don't need more theology. I don't believe that because theology is the study of God. We need to study God. So uh, we do need theological understanding, all right? So I'm not up here to just spout off theological jargon, but if you'll just give me just a few minutes, and I'm not asking you to accept everything that I say to you. I'm asking you to consider this. I'm asking you to consider this. Even God says in his word to consider your ways. So there are things that we have to consider, things that we have to meditate upon and ponder. Now, where I want to begin going into this is of something that the Lord has begun to bring to my attention, not just in recent days, but over the course of probably the last, I'll say maybe 15 to 20 years, that the modern church has entered into a phase of what I am calling an overemphasizing of grace. Now, as I go forward in this, I want you to know and understand that I'm not against grace. I'm not speaking against grace. But I, had, I began to sense this. And it's not just something that I'm sensing. I, I used to attend while I was in Bible college. I attended a very large ministry of which I will not name. Uh, while I lived in Charlotte, I attended uh, quite a few churches. That was really some of our assignment was to go to different churches and I had, you know, sit in and funerals and weddings and so on and so forth. And I was basically to study what was happening within the mechanics of various churches. Some of the things that I began to notice at that time, and that was, uh, Lord, that was over 20 years ago, is I began to recognize an overemphasizing of grace. And why am I saying overemphasizing? There seemed to be this, and I'm making notes here and points that you can uh, follow along with me here. This overfixation is, is emphasized in Christian media, and it's not just from a pulpit perspective, but I noticed it's also in the media, in Christian media, Christian magazines. Uh, Christian TV, Christian radio, if you, I would challenge you, and I, I did this some even yesterday, I went into a Christian bookstore, just to look at how many book titles are entitled with something about grace. It seems that almost every preacher, every teacher, every ministry has something about grace. And I'm like, Lord, uh, is this something that you are really emphasizing at this time in the body of Christ? Or, or is this something else? Because, you know, I'm, I am just not seeing that this is producing uh, a fruit within the church that seems to be congenial to the Scripture. So uh, I'm, I'm of the sort 
listen, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not skeptical or cynical, but I am the type of person that questions, okay? And I don't think it's wrong to ask questions. I ask questions because I want to learn. You know, if, if, if uh, one of the things you can always establish about a, a cult is you don't question anything within a cult. Uh, I'm not part of a cult. I am part of the body of Christ. And the disciples had all kind of questions with Jesus. I mean, they came to him privately and asked him questions. So I have questions. Uh, and sometimes I have more questions than I do answers. But uh, my questions uh, are not concerning uh, Christ and his word here, but rather what seems to be, uh, why does this seem to be so popular? So uh, this is just my estimation of it. Uh, you can take on your own concerning this, but I, I, I've been given a pulpit in order for a reason to communicate things. I believe that this has become like a new drug to Christianity. The whole grace movement, that's what it's, it's literally called. You can go Google this. You can look it up. You can get on Google, Ray, and look up. You can, you can type in grace movement. <coughs> I'm watching this as there is this overfixation within Christianity that this thing is beginning to spiral into uh, something that I believe is going to be unfavorable to the body of Christ because this has been done before. So stay with me. There's our cookies. We'll bring them up. I'm calling them grace cookies. Everybody, does everybody, I love cookies, right? I love to eat cookies. Cookies are good, especially that kind, chocolate chip. My wife can make some awesome cookies. When they come right out of the stove, man, they are the best. I'm calling this grace cookies because there's something not just within adults, but also children. You throw a plate of cookies out here and the children will run to them. I call this grace cookies because there are things that we can eat and consume that are, they are they're nice, they're delightful, uh, they're sweet to our taste. But if this becomes the, the whole scope of my diet, then eventually I will wind up in an unhealthy place. I cannot eat cookies three times a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and, and, and sustain a healthy lifestyle off of that diet alone. So that's why I'm trying to point this out because I believe within the body of Christ there, is, there has to be a healthy diet that we feed upon. You know, Jesus had said to Peter, he said, feed my sheep. Uh, and I believe that the, the, the ministry of Christ has a responsibility, and I believe us also as Christians, uh, we have a responsibility to feed other people the gospel. Now, uh, this, the gospel has to be presented in a way that is not just favorable uh, to men, but it also has to be presented as it is the truth. And sometimes the truth is not very cookie-like. Uh, it's not very sweet. You know, sometimes the truth, the, the truth is the truth, and it, it can seem to be uh, rather hard at times. But, you know, we need to hear truth. So, <coughs> a couple of things here. Then I ask, is this message of grace so indelibly indulged within the context of Scripture for Christianity to be so fixated upon this? Now, you may not have... Uh, you may not have paid this any attention. I'm bringing this up so that you will. Because uh, I encourage people to please listen to other people than me. Thank you. You'll need that, all right? You need, to, you need other gospel input, okay? Uh, I believe if that weren't the case, God wouldn't have given apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. That means uh, I need more than just uh, a prophet in my life. I need a pastor. I need, I need uh, other input within my life. So... Uh, you're going to be uh, not just inundated, but also uh, I believe many of you, you listen to crypto, uh, you probably watch Christian TV, read magazines, you read books. I hope you are. I'm just saying this so that you will be aware, okay? Because many times what I've found through uh, over about 15 years of, of pastoring uh, and being in the ministry, I have found that it is, it is more difficult to deal with 
something that is already rooted or ingrained in someone than, uh, and I'm talking with, within a doctoral standpoint, when someone believes something, if they believe something wrong, it is harder to deal with that thing than if they believe nothing concerning the subject. So, uh, I just want you to be aware of, I'm not trying to cause you to be skeptical, but uh, does this overemphasis need further investigation? That's my question. Yes, it does. I believe that we need to investigate why is this being emphasized so much. And I don't want to spend my whole time here talking about grace because I've got something greater uh, that I believe that I need to talk about. So uh, look at this statement right here. Overemphasizing or adding to what the Bible teaches inevitably does more harm than good. Who made this statement? Dr. Kenneth Hagin. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Kenneth Hagin, uh, but this is a statement that he made. Overemphasizing what the Bible teaches inevitably leads to more harm than good. Okay? And he's talking about if you begin to overemphasize one thing over another. All right? I know all of us have our taste, we have our own likings, we have our own preferences. You know, my children, they come to the, the meal table every night, and I'm like, uh, you're not going to just get a plate full of meatballs. You get you some of that salad, and you get you some of them green beans. Yeah, you know, and then, because I know that they need more than just meat and protein. They need other nutrients in their life. Going on here far, I believe the hyper-grace message could be the end-time deception that will cause millions of people to fall away from God. This is a word from Sid Roth. If you ever watch Sid Roth on Christian Broadcasting, I didn't say this, Sid Roth said this. So obviously I am not the only person that is aware of this uh, and, and what is being propagated within the body of Christ. Uh, there are other people who are uh, well aware of this, uh, even you know further than I am, of course. So thank God for that. But I need to look at this, and I need to be able to look at it from a broad spectrum. Look at this statement. I still don't know what's more outrageous, that programmers allow such insanity on Christian television or that gullible Christians fall for it year after year. This is Lee Grady. He is the former editor of Charisma Magazine. You know, uh, these people are taking notice of what is being spoken to the body of Christ. I believe that we should be aware. I preached a message a couple of weeks ago uh, called Take Heed How You Hear. Amen. It's very important that we take heed to what we are listening to, not just who we are listening to. And we do need trusted uh, people within the body of Christ that we can uh, trust enough that they are uh, bringing forth the word of God. <coughs> Excuse me. So, uh, you know, I'm not just out here on my own, you know, I've, I've been accused of such before of being just, well, you, do, you know, you're just out there on your own doing this. I, well, I'm stating people that are, have been uh, rather notable figures within the body of Christ. So going on here, uh, I believe that this is a, an overemphasized message because it's, it's a, a, an appeal to the masses. Uh, we have today, and I'm not against this, but we have some of the largest churches that have ever existed before in Christianity. I'm talking about, and we're a small church, and I don't have a problem with that. Uh, but we have churches now that have 30, 40,000 members, uh, and, and they have coliseums. Uh, I have been in both sides of ministry. I've been in a small church, and I've been in large churches. Okay, And each has its pros and cons. I typically like to be in a smaller fellowship because I can know people, you know, uh, and I'm not just hiding in the crowd, but I can literally get to know people. I, I, I feel like I need fellowship with other believers. Uh, so uh, here's a couple of statements that I've heard within the grace movement uh, is that there's nothing that you can do that pleases God. I've heard this several times. Maybe you haven't, but it, if you will being said, uh, at some point you probably will hear this within things that are preached or taught. Now, I'm not trying to be skeptical against Christianity. Lord have mercy. We don't need any more of that, but we do need, uh, we need, we need the spirit of truth and not the spirit of error. You know, the Bible tells me uh, that without faith that it is impossible to please God. 
Uh, so the Bible tells me that I can please God and I can please him through faith. The Bible also tells me that I am to walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing uh, so there is a way or a manner in which I can walk and conduct myself in life uh, that pleases God. Okay, so, uh, you know, I've heard this statement, all that pleases God is Christ. Well, the scriptures that I just uh, quoted seem to indicate that I can please God as well. Now, I'm not trying to preach to you any type of works, religion, or uh, legalism, but uh, I've heard this one as well. God only examines your life according to the past, which is Christ. God only examines your life according to the past, which is Christ. In other words, that you you don't you're not you're not even existent anymore. It's all this is all Jesus. Okay, stay with me for just a minute. This means that anything that is being is currently being done in my life presently that God's not even looking at it. Now, here's some more cookies. Okay. This is real sweet, doesn't it? it sounds, this sounds so great, but then we have scripture that's on the other hand. Now, I'm making a point here again. I am not against grace. I understand what the scripture says concerning grace. It says that I am saved by grace through faith. So I'm not against grace here, y'all. Stay with me on that, all right? I believe in a healthy biblical view and having biblical proportions, okay? Biblical proportions. What do I mean by that? I cannot grace out here. The scripture is clear to me. If you do a study of the book of Corinthians, you can find that you have some very highly sophisticated spiritual people, but yet at the same time, they were very, very carnal. You know, Paul goes into this many times, and he said, even in Hebrews, I would like to speak to you uh, like that you were adults, but I can't because you're babes. You're still carnal. Uh, you know, the, the Corinthian church was graced out. You know, they, they just, they believe that, you know, it doesn't matter whatever you do. Grace has got you, okay? <coughs> so this idea is not new uh, to civilization, nor is it new to Christianity. The Bible is filled with this. Now, there are other uh, counter uh, opinions of such, but contrary, and I'm going to make this statement, contrary to the pop culture, that's what I call it, it's pop culture, it's pop culture theology. I have watched uh, over 23 years of Christianity. I've, I've watched fads come in to the body of Christ, and, they, and the fads fade. Okay, I, I've seen a lot of fads come through. Uh, whenever I see something, uh, not just, I'm, I'm not, listen, I am not against anything new. Okay, well, I believe that there is uh, a, a sense of progressive revelation that is happening in the body of Christ. Uh, that we are progressing, we should be seeing more clearly, things should be made, being made known to us, but when I see something that begins to take hold within the body of Christ, uh, and it seems like it is the popular thing, uh, then I have this tendency to proceed with caution, okay, because I'm looking at this through also other various scriptures, such as uh, when the Apostle Peter said, uh, he warned us that there would be uh, false teachers who would come in among us. And he said that they would make merchandise of you. Okay? Uh, he, you know, Paul said that he feared because he knew that grievous wolves would come in among us. And, and they wouldn't spare the body. So we've already been warned through scripture that there are people among us. You know, John talked about them. They, they were with us, but they weren't of us. They went out from us. Uh, there are people amongst the body of Christ, and many of these, and unfortunately I'm going to say this, they stand within pulpits. Now, that wouldn't be of my favor to sit and knock on a pulpit because I am uh, a pastor, but I'm, I'm not up here to knock on other pastors. Uh, but I, I do look at what is happening, at the marketing that is happening to the body of Christ and how the gospel is being marketed Many of the pastors nowadays, folks, you don't have to do any more than go to a job website, type up pastor, and look at the qualities that most churches are looking for a pastor, and you will see nothing concerning his character. He must be dynamic. You know, he has to be a dynamic speaker. They want someone who's engaging. It doesn't matter about his character anymore, whether he lives a holy life. This doesn't even matter anymore. So uh, within the pop culture, this is all about 
what I would call numbers and results. How many people, this is, this is within the American culture. We think that something, if it's bigger, it's better. Or if it's bigger, you know, then it, that it seems to have more, uh, what's the word I'm looking here for, Lord? Well, I'll come back to that. We seem to be, oh, yeah. We, we seem like we've got to be more relevant. You know, we've got, here, here's the thing that is happening within much of the church now is that we have franchise churches. Watch, watch what's happening, I'm telling you. It's, everybody wants to be like Walmart, and they want to franchise this church in every town. You know, you can look, you'll find, now we, we don't have autonomous bodies. We, we have campus, you have a campus pastor. And this campus pastor answers to the, the mega church over at so-and-so, and you've got to replicate what they're doing over here. Now, I'm not saying that all of that, uh, that paradigm and model is wrong because, you know, I can see within the New Testament that Paul went out from uh, Antioch and he went out to, to do what they were doing in Antioch. Anyway, everything now within Christianity has to seem to be uplifting, positive, positive encouraging and inspiring. Let me say this to you. It is not my job as a pastor to inspire you every week. If you become dependent upon me to inspire you in Christianity, then I become like a drug and you will need me. That is not my job within the body of Christ. My job as a pastor is to love and also correct people in the body of Christ. You know, correct, correction and discipline have seemed to be something that have faded away from the churches. I call it the church dirty word now. We don't, that's like a saying a cuss word. Don't you dare say discipline in church. You know, if you're going to be a disciple, then you have to have a measure of discipline. And you also have to have a measure of accountability. So, uh, you know, I, I'm not, I don't feel like I'm here to just pump people up every week. If I pump you up, I'm going to just make you vain. And the Bible says that whatever puffs up is... Vain. So, uh, we, amen. We don't, we don't, you know, I ain't saying that you don't need to be inspired many times. I'm going forward here. So the, the hyper grace movement, that's what it's called in actuality. You can go look it up. Is also an ultra dispensationalism. If you don't, not familiar with dispensationalism, I will tell you this first off and foremost. If you are near me, uh, under me in ministry, around me in ministry, you're going to find that I have a great uh, dissatisfaction for a thing that's called dispensationalism. I'll teach you on it more later. I hate this doctrine. Uh, Jesus hated doctrines. He told many churches in the book of Revelation, I hate your doctrine. I hate what you believe. We don't think of sweet Jesus saying that he hates something. What this really is, is a repackaged predestination and a repackaged Calvinism. If you're not familiar with, in, with those doctrines within the realms of Christianity, one of the doctrines of Calvinism is irresistible grace. And irresistible grace, within this whole realm of irresistible grace, teaches that there are people who are either predestined by God to go to heaven or predestined to go to hell. Did y'all know that? Okay, the, the majority of the churches within this territory hold the doctrine of predestination. I won't name the denominations by name, but I'll let you go discover it for yourself concerning that. An irresistible grace. In other words, that when God begins to pursue someone through grace, that they cannot by their own will resist him. Y'all with me? I'll wait for just a minute. So silence in the face of this. Listen to this statement. This is not my statement. Silence in the face of evil is itself evil. And God will not hold us guiltless. To not speak is to speak. And to not act is to act. You could sit and say, Todd, why are you spending your time talking about this? Couldn't you be talking about something more important coming from the scripture? There's your author, Diedrich Bonhoeffer. If you've never heard of him, 
He was a Lutheran pastor in Nazi Germany that spoke out very boldly against Adolf Hitler. And he was actually executed by the Nazis uh, in 1945, a few days before the, United, before the Americans uh, invaded Nazi Germany. So silence is not golden in these matters. I believe it is our job to erase or rise up awarenesses to various things that are going on around us. I believe it is my job to speak to you concerning this. This is, I don't expect this to send you out of here today being, you know, hooping and hollering and, and dancing your way out to church. I don't expect that. What I expect from this is that possibly this will plant a seed within your heart uh, to be aware of what you are listening to or what you are hearing. You know, and I'm not trying to just get you to listen through a filter, but you do need to listen with some type of filter, okay? Because somebody can talk, come up, walk, walk up to you uh, nowadays, uh, they can be smoking a joint and talking to you about Jesus, and, and, and you'd be like, wow, they got all kind of revelation. Yeah, I mean, it's just it's phenomenal to me today of what we do accept and then what we do reject. I'm like, what? I mean, I feel like I live in a society with a, a bunch of lunatics. I'm like, we, we call what is evil good and what is good evil. I'm like, what? So anyway, uh, listen to this statement right here. The chief danger of the 20th century will be religion without the Holy Ghost, Christianity without Christ, forgiveness, and I underline this, forgiveness without repentance, Salvation without regeneration and heaven without hell. This was said by William Booth, uh, who was a Methodist preacher, and he also started the Salvation Army. The Salvation Army has changed vastly. Lord have mercy. It used to be about saving souls. These were radical people, man. William Booth, he would take a group of children into a nightclub or a bar, and he would get up on top of the bar with the children and begin to sing to the Lord in the midst of everybody drinking and carousing and doing what they were doing. And uh, they would, either the place would clear out, they would either get kicked out, uh, or somebody was going to get saved. So these were radical Christians. We don't see radical, all we hear about is radical Islam. I'm so tired of hearing about this. When are we ever going to have any radical Christians? We have now taken a back seat in society, uh, and, and we're just sitting around being silent and keeping it in the church. And, and at the same time, the churches that are uh, the predominant voices in the church, they are uh, unwilling to confront the society on sin. Everything is, is so grace now. Oh, it doesn't matter. God's got grace. Come on. All right, so I'm going to move forward here. These are the following quotes from, I'm not trying to point him out, but I can't help it. He put it out there. His name is Joseph Prince. Now, I don't typically do this, y'all. Most of the time I keep people's names reserved, but this man is also called the Prince of Grace. Now, he is a pastor of a very large church in Singapore, but uh, for the most part he has a very big presence in the United States as far as his book, his ministry, TV ministry, uh, you know, he's an, an Asian guy, but this comes from a book that he has written called Destined to Reign. And these, these are statements within this book. There are nothing but blessings for believers. God will never judge America for her sin. If you receive a word from someone which brings your sins to remembrance or instills an expectation of punishment for sins in your life, do not fear it. Just throw it out the window. And lastly, repentance and confession of sin are never necessary. You're going to hear what is being spoken to the body of Christ. And this is not, I've heard this statement more than once, not just from him. Yeah. Repentance and confession of sin is no longer necessary. Now, you can engage this crowd with an argument straight out of 1 John 1 and 9. It says that if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now, their answer to this will be that this is a part of a dispensation with, which was in the body of Christ that John wrote this before Paul ever began to speak of grace. Absolutely not. 
That means you are beginning to remove large portions of Scripture that you would say have no basis. This is, I've already had this discussion with people in the body of Christ. You know, everything is about the finished work of Jesus. And I'm like, well, at what point do you repent here? At what point is repentance a necessary facet in your life? You know, it's as if sin does, listen, what they will tell you is, is that sin is no longer existent in your life because you are in Christ. I'm like, well, how is it that you're still struggling with this sin? My God. All right. So when the, the gospel is presented through a singular lens, we will wind up with a distorted view of who God is. And I believe that this is what this is producing. If I only look at God through the lens of grace, I will never see all of who God is. I'm not trying to de-emphasize grace. You need to have an understanding of the grace of God. But here's my definition of grace. Grace is not God overlooking sin. Grace is the power to go beyond your own abilities. I believe that God empowers us to live above or beyond sin's power and that we are to overcome sin. Not just, it's in my life and I live with it until I go to heaven. No, that is not grace. Grace is not excusing sin. It is not turning an eye to sin. God cannot. He cannot. Listen, when Adam and Eve sinned, God didn't show up at the garden and say, now I saw what y'all did, but I'm just going to turn my head and forget about this whole thing and we're just going to move on. That's not what happened. God confronted him on the matter until he came forth out of his hiding. The Holy Spirit, listen, I don't know why we think that, and if we present the gospel in such a manner that we are talking Yes, sinners need to understand that, that God has grace and that he loves them. But the Bible tells me that the Spirit has been sent forth into the world to convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. This is what the Holy Spirit is talking about. So, you know, I've, I have heard this firsthand witness. You can ask my wife because I was sitting in a church service in, in Charlotte one time. And the, the pastor said from the pulpit, he said, the reason why the church is still living in sin is because the, the church keeps talking about sin. I stood up, I couldn't help it, I jumped up, and I was like, I ain't heard nobody talking about sin. And my wife grabbed me and pulled me down. I ain't heard nobody talking about sin. Nobody in the church wants to seem like they want to talk about, they don't want to, it's like, well, God's got grace. All right, I'm getting off of that soapbox, and we'll move on. The ministry is called to feed responsibly, all right? So here's what I want to present is on the other side of this is that we have, have an overemphasized grace, but we have de-emphasized holiness. Listen to me for just a minute. If you start preaching on holiness, people in the church start looking at you like you're stupid now. Right. You know, what's he talking about? We don't even know what he's talking about. We can talk about grace and people, they'll eat it up like little sweet cookies. It's, it's, sound, it's good. This is good. This is the sweetness. It is the goodness of God. It is the goodness of God that leads a man to repentance. But I want you to know at the same time that God is a holy God. He is a holy God. Listen to this for just a second. The, God is ascribed much more in the Bible as being holy than he is gracious. Amen. I can prove this. You can do your own study. There are over 600 references in Scripture to holy or holiness versus there are less than 200 references to grace in the Bible. So I'm asking the question, why are we emphasizing something that is less emphasized within the Word of God? The Word of God emphasizes, I've, I believe I've found that it emphasizes God's holiness more than any other thing within Scripture. Y'all better stay with me because you're hearing all kind of things. The emphasis within Scripture, it emphasizes holiness more than God's love, more than God's mercy, more than God's compassion, more than God's kindness, even more than His justice or even anything that is miraculous. Think about this for just a minute. Think about this. I try not to listen to what's being said on earth, but what's being said in heaven. 
And this is what I find the angels continuously ascribing to God. They are not saying, grace, 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 you are so gracious. When they look at him, this is not what they ascribe to him as being the predominant thing that stands out to them. Hear what I'm talking about. I mean, you could sit here today and, and out of all that I said, you could say, wow, pastor got some nice shoes. <laughs> Honey, I don't buy no cheap wingtips neither. Okay? I, buy, I bought the most ex, probably one of the most expensive pairs because I'm going to wear these babies. Now, I don't just buy expensive shoes, but I, I, I go to a men's warehouse. I don't go to... I go get my shoes, all right? I got good ones. Now, y'all could walk out of here and go, wow, his shoes. And not hear a thing I said. This is, I'm making a point here. Is that we look at things about God and begin to, our attention is drawn to something here that is not the most important thing. So here's some milk. We got to have some milk. The Bible says we need milk. I'm, I'm starting to feed with milk here. The milk of the word is this, that there is a greater emphasis in Scripture concerning the holiness of God than there is about his grace. Heaven is ascribing him as holy, three times holy. Look at it with me in Revelation 4 and verse 8. You can see what the angels are saying. He said, they say here, and the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes and within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy. And they can't just say it once. Twice, holy. Three times, holy. Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. When, when John the, the Revelator saw this, he was seeing exactly what Isaiah, look at it with me in Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah says that he saw the Lord high and lifted up. Why is it when these people are seeing, when they are seeing into heaven and they're seeing a manifestation of the presence of God and seeing the angels of God, the angels are not sitting around talking about how gracious God is. They're talking about how holy he is. <coughs> In verse 3 he says, and one cried to another. These angels are flying around him and they're saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. This is what they keep ascribing to him over and over and over. Now, listen to me for just a minute. Holiness is more than a concept about some moral attributes of God. This is God's distinguishing characteristic. This, this is what distinguishes is God as God. I, I'm going to give you some definition here. Because the word that appears here in Hebrew is kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. That's what they are saying. They are saying that it is to be clean. By This is what is emanating out of God. Is his, his cleanness. This is what radiates from him. It's his, his purity of who he is. This is what, when you look into the face of God, you cry holy. You know, you don't just... You're not, you're thinking, if you're thinking in the terms of grace, you're thinking, oh, just overlook this in me. Listen, this is not about us, uh, him looking at us, but us looking at him. I'm fixing my eyes on him. And the fixing of my eyes on him, I have to see that he is holy. He is a holy God. He is, he is sacred. He is, is he hallows. He makes, uh, things, uh, sanctified. He consecrates. This literally means in its meaning that when you look at God and you say that he is holy, you are saying that he is perfect. Perfect. We've never seen anything that's perfect because we have been so focused on the imperfections of ourself. Listen, as this goes further. I study this as much as I possibly can. God holds all spiritual excellence and he inspires. When you see how excellent, that's what the angels, they're looking at his excellence and it is, they're just overwhelmed continuously. They do that day and night. This never gets old to them. You could say, why not this get old? Because every time they look, they see more. 
They see more of his excellence, more, and this inspires awe because God is different than anything else. He is different than any being, any animal, any creature, anything that's even in created. God even has to, the Bible says that when he looks on things in heaven, he has to humble himself to look on what's in heaven. God is so high and so holy and so mighty and so full of majesty that there is nothing else like him in all of the universe, in all of the world that is, is to come. There's nothing like him. And that's why they call him holy. There's nothing else you can say. He's holy. And this thing belongs to God. It belongs to him. Holiness is his. It doesn't belong to another. It belongs to him. But listen, this separation of who he is and the absoluteness of his majesty, yet it is uncommon, but yet it is also attached to him as the invisible God. And anything that he associates himself with then becomes holy. Y'all better hear what I'm saying. Anything that God associates himself with, it is called holy. When God appeared to Moses, Moses walked into his midst and God told him, take off thy sandals from thy feet for the ground which you stand upon is holy. If God stepped on the ground, then the ground was holy. Amen. If God... Everything within the tabernacle and the temple was called holy. God said that even the utensils that the priests were to use, those were holy. Everything that was set aside for him was holy. You came into his holy tabernacle. It was the tabernacle of the testimony of who God is in his holiness. You entered into that court and then you entered into, there was another court, the holy of holies. And then there was the holiest of all. Anything that God associates himself with it becomes holy. This is why the Bible tells us in Corinthians that we are to come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord, and I will be a father unto you. He said, touch not the unclean thing. This is where the word saint arises from, hagios, that you are a holy, you are holy. You are, the only reason that you are holy is because you are in association with him. Your association with him. Hear me out in this for just a minute. Write a note to yourself. I'm going to end on this. The message of holiness has become a lost facet to the body of Christ because we do not emphasize this. We do not emphasize it amongst ourselves. We do not emphasize this amongst the body of Christ. And we do not emphasize this concerning who God is. When the church begins to turn and focus upon the holiness of God, this thing has in the past, I'm telling you according to the past, it has ascribed to the church what is called an awakening if you will go and study the second great awakening, second great awakening in America, it was all based on what was called the holiness movement. The holiness movement was a movement within the body of Christ where the body of Christ began to emphasize holiness and the holiness of God and that we were to live holy and to be holy. Listen to what I'm saying because... Uh, you can't escape the scripture ever. Leviticus 19 and verse 2. God said, I am holy, therefore be ye also holy. For I, the Lord your God, am holy. He says, if I'm holy, then you be holy. If you're going to associate with me, you're going to have to be holy. What does this begin to do within the body of Christ? It does the completely opposite of what the grace movement is doing. It literally begins to cause introspection. People begin to inspect their own hearts and inspect their own lives. And unless you ever do this, you will never repent. This is why the grace movement is telling people that repentance is not necessary. Confession of sin is not. This is contrary to the scripture. This will never lead the church to a revival. You may wind up with some 35,000 members, but they will be 35,000 carnal members. 
You know, I've had people, I, this is why I, I engage, uh, I stopped going to pastor's conferences and all this mess. Cause they always ask, how many people you got in your church and what you building? You know, I said, look here, I don't really care about how many people are sitting there every Sunday. I'm not concerned with how many numbers there are. My concern is, with, are they growing in Christ? Or are they growing to be more like Jesus? I'm not trying to, to pack them in. If I was, I'd get me a good grace message and market it. And they'd come running in. God ain't looking at y'all saying no more. You know, what are you, y'all hear what I'm saying? Adam's tendency through sin is to hide from God. Well, if you, t Lord have mercy. If you tell them that God ain't looking at this anymore, then they're going to come running. That's because they're not hearing his voice. Because Adam said, I heard your voice, and I went and hid myself. His voice, listen, when you hear the voice of God, it searches you out because his voice is holy. And all of the character and nature of who he is is holy. And that holiness begins to search you out. And if you will allow the holiness of God to search you out, you begin to see the, not just the flaws in your life, but you see that only God can correct this. And you become dependent on him, not just in a manner of graciousness, but you understand that I need to be purified. I need to be made holy before the Lord. Amen. You know, the, the priest of God, this is what they carried upon the, the frontlet of their head. It said, holiness unto the Lord. This is the problem in the body of Christ. We don't carry a holiness unto the Lord anymore. Amen. Amen. I'm not trying to preach a good message here. I'm just saying, look. We have to put an emphasis on this because this is what is emphasized about God. His Holy Son, Jesus. Think about this for just a minute. I only can find one reference to the Holy Spirit as being a spirit of grace. But it's over 200 times that he is ascribed as the Holy Spirit. Think about that for just a minute. He's not just the Spirit of God. He is holy. He is holy. He is the Holy Spirit. If I'm going to interact with the Holy Spirit, then there's got to be some measure of holiness that he's imparting into my life. The holiness of God is me coming out from the world. John said, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. He said, for if the love of the world is in you, then the love of the Father is not in you. The, all that's in the world is the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. These are not of the Father, but they are of the world. My job here is not just to, to get in here and accommodate the world. It is to be something different than the world. That's what, that's what we are. We are different. Don't be afraid to be different. Don't be ashamed to be different. Look, look right over. Do you want a different life? It's right over. Every week, y'all look at that. Do you want a different life? Be, having a different life means that I'm living a holy life in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. We are in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. And you have been called out. You are the electos. You are the ecclesia of God. You have been called out of this world not to live like this. You know, some of the Lord, the Lord said to me one time, the first time I ever got an interpretation of tongues, I was walking through my house praying in tongues, and all of a sudden my tongues turned to English, and the Lord said to me, you are in this world, but you are not of this world. And I heard it come out of my own mouth. And I, it, it got me so excited, Lori. I'm in this world, but I am no longer of this world. Glory to God. This world is, I live here. It is a mess. Yes, it is. I live here, but I have been put here to make a difference in this world, and I'm not going to make any difference without the holiness of God being evident in my life. Now, we can keep on eating grace cookies, and they're good, and they're sweet, but I can tell you this, too. When the grace message came along, most of you, some of you in here, you may be familiar with what happened through, I, I'm a student of church history, because I can see where the church went right and where it went wrong in some instances. The holiness movement that happened in the church in America, this thing, it changed the world. The second great awakening changed the world because the church was so focused on the holiness of God. Now, I'm not saying that the church should overemphasize that, but at some point we've got to emphasize this. In this emphasis, this spiraled into thousands and people being saved. Now, what began to happen in the midst of that is that the church began to look to be restored to what it formerly was. 
the church began to look for what it formerly was. Where did they look? They looked in the scripture. The holiness movement caused the church to begin to look into the book of Acts and say, what have we lost? Not only have we lost the holiness of God, the church becomes a mess when it does not have the holiness of God. It becomes a mess and a muck and a quagmire of, of uh, useless fleshliness and sin. I did say quagmire. It becomes a swamp. Swamps do not smell right. The church does not smell right. So the church began to look for where has it gone wrong. We have to look for where we've gone wrong. In this pursuit, here's what began to happen, and this is what began to unfold. The church began to look for where has it lost its apostolic roots. In looking for this in its apostolic roots, the church then turned and began to focus on sanctification. Do you know what sanctification is? Sanctification is a process by where you are made holy. It began to search for sanctification, not the sanctification that was in the spirit, but a sanctification in their soul. This happened at Azusa Street, early 1900 in America, Los Angeles. This birthed and began what was called the Pentecostal movement. All of this came out of the holiness movement. This came from the holiness movement. We now can see that when the church began to seek for the holiness of God, that it began to look for its own sanctification and how it could be sanctified before God and be cleansed and pure before God because they realized that in receiving the Holy Spirit that I was not just to be full of the Holy Spirit but that I was to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit and I cannot walk in the power of the Holy Spirit unless I am living a holy life before Him. So they have to begin to seek how am I going to live a holy life before God? Because I don't want to just walk in the grace of God. I want to walk in the power of God. And in order to walk in the power of God, I have to live a sanctified life. Most people have heard about Azusa Street that are of any kind of Pentecostal roots, but they don't know how it ended. Revivals start and revivals end. And that revival, it carried on in other places, but it ended there because another preacher rose up and started preaching the finished work and grace. And this caused such a division that where God birthed the modern Pentecostal movement, it split. These two are, I'm not telling you that the grace of God and the holiness of God are the opposite, but it is, this is like mixing oil and water together as far as a doctrinal scope. If this becomes your emphasis, it will lead the church in one direction, and if the other becomes the emphasis, it will lead the church. Your vision determines your direction. And your vision is determined by what you are focused on and what you are looking at. Y'all better hear what I just said because I just gave you a million dollar statement. Your vision determines your direction and your vision is determined by what you are focused on. You, if you become focused on the holiness of God, this is where you're going to go towards. This is, and this is why I'm saying we've got to begin to steer the church. And if this has to be a, a milk message on it, then glory to God. I'm, I'm going to take hold of a wheel here and start steering the church away from what I see as the modern, the popular, and what seems to be f such fad faddish. I'll just call it faddish. I don't even know if it's a word. I made up a new word, April. Faddish. I love to make up new words. It's faddish. We have to steer away from that. Fads make money, but I'm not into fads. And I'm not here to make money. I'm here to follow Jesus. Amen. Amen. I said that real plainly. I am not here to make money. I am here to follow Jesus. Amen. You can't serve God and money. You can't. Sorry, you got to make a decision. Thank you, Father. Lord, when 
and I look at your word, and I see, Lord, if I were just to look through the eyes of the angels and see what they see, they see that you're a holy God. Your holiness, Lord, it begins to invoke inside of me a fear and a reverence towards you. Because, God, this sums up who you are. You said, I, the Lord your God, am a holy God. Lord, today, let this measure, Lord, let this be emphasized in my heart today that you are holy and that I have a need in my life to be holy like you are holy. I thank you for that today, God. Now, Father, as I close this out today, God, I pray that you will speak very plainly to our heart concerning the milk of the word. And, God, that we will have a desire to rise up in our hearts, Lord, to be consecrated unto you, to be wholly given unto you, Lord, for sanctification to be worked into our lives. Because I want to be like you. That's really what I want here, God. I'm not, I'm not looking for just your forgiveness of sin, but, Lord, to be like you. I want to be holy like you are holy. If that's your, if that's your heart today while I'm closing this in prayer, let that be your prayer as well, that I want to be holy like you are holy, God. That's not an impossible thing. Hear me out. Because I believe that God begins to put measures of holiness into our lives. He said we don't have because we don't ask. We have to begin to ask God that he just begin to instill and cause his own holiness to emanate out from my heart and my life. That I, Lord, that my desires be changed. That my wants, my desires, that Lord, that the desires of my flesh do not rule in my life. But God, that I walk in the spirit. For you said that the desires of the spirit, they are contrary to the flesh. And the lust of the flesh, they are contrary to the spirit. Because your spirit is a holy spirit. I thank you, Holy Spirit, for being evidenced in our lives. Lord, through your own holiness. And I praise you for that today. In the name of Jesus. Now, if you need prayer, I'll be here. Other than that, I, I challenge you to dig into the scriptures. There's over 600 references concerning his holiness. That gives you plenty to study. Amen.